Okay, cool. Uh, okay, we're nearing the end of the course. Uh, I think we have about six or so lectures left. I haven't counted them, but now we're really getting into uh, many different processing paradigms in digital design and computer architecture. And today we're going to cover three of them uh, that have had significant influence on systems, uh, VLIW, uh, systolic arrays, and uh, decoupled access and execute. So hopefully it's going to be a lot of fun and a lot of principles also. Uh, a lot of principles go into building these systems and they target different kind of applications, let's say, and hopefully it'll be clear. Next week, we're going to cover SIMD processors and GPUs, another paradigm that has had a lot of impact, significant, uh, of course, as you probably know well, uh, but we'll go into how they work also, and we'll compare and contrast them to systolic arrays as well as VLIW. But let's start with VLIW, uh, and this is the outline of the next few lectures, this week and next week, basically. Uh, and VLIW stands for Very Long Instruction Word Architectures. And this is an instruction set architecture paradigm. And you will see the philosophy of it. The philosophy is basically keep the hardware as simple as possible, and software does the hard work to extract parallelism, basically. So what, uh, essentially, we've seen the multiple instruction fetch concept before. And that's the idea of superscalar processing, right? In superscalar processing, hardware fetches multiple instructions. And it's the hardware task uh, to check dependencies between them. Compiler can help, as we discussed. Compiler can schedule instructions such that uh, the concurrently fetched instructions don't have dependencies between them, but it doesn't have to. The superior scalar processor pro provides a support for dependency checking uh, for sure. VLIW uh, has a different principle. Uh, it's very long instruction word. We will see why that is. And uh, basically the idea is to have the software pack independent instructions, completely independent instructions in a larger instruction bundle to be fetched, decoded, renamed. Uh, well, let's not talk about renaming right now. Fetched, decoded, executed, and finished concurrently. Essentially, th th these instructions, this instruction bundle that consists of multiple small instructions flow through the pipeline, flows through the pipeline at the same time. And it's the compiler's job to guarantee that they're completely independent so that the hardware doesn't need to do any dependence checking. Basically, hardware fetches and executes the instructions in the bundle concurrently. It doesn't need to do dependence checking between those concurrently fetched instructions in the VLIW mod. So that's the difference between VLIW and superscalar. And after learning superscalar, VLIW is not a huge step in, uh, from, uh, in a conceptual manner, of course. But uh, the thinking is very different. And because the principle is that software needs to do all the dependence checking and ensuring that the instructions can be concurrently executed, now the software needs to be very intelligent. OK, so this is a pictorial view of the VLIW concept. You have a program counter. And with that program counter, it's still a sequential uh, uh, model, right? But it's not von Neumann in the sense that when you fetch the program counter, when you actually uh, get to the program counter, you fetch multiple instructions that are concurrently uh, executed, uh, that can be concurrently executed without the hardware checking for dependency. So this example, you have an add, you have load, you have move, you have multiply and they can be concurrently executed at the same time. So this is clearly based on the von Neumann model, but you're not doing one instruction at a time. You're doing multiple operations at a time. And uh, it was introduced in the seminal paper by Josh Fisher, uh, who uh, introduced this enormously long word instruction computer, ELI 512. And uh, in that computer, uh, basically they had 512 bit instruction words and they could pat many instructions into those 512 bit instruction words. Uh, you, can, you can imagine, you can compare that to existing instruction words that we have in MIPS, for example. MIPS has 32 bits, right? So you can pack, assuming each instruction is 32 bits, you can pack uh, 16 instructions uh, to be executed concurrently. And later we will see VLIW machines that are built that can fetch, decode, execute 28 instructions concurrently. Now, of course, the compiler needs to ensure that you have 28 instructions that can be executed concurrently uh, in a single cycle. So conceptually, it's beautiful, as you can see. So as I said, a very long instruction word consists of multiple independent instructions packed together by the compiler or the programmer. But programmer is tough, actually. In fact, the VLIW uh, proponents also uh, say it's very tough to program these machines. So you really need automatic compilation into them. But again, you, you can imagine programming at an assembly level as well. 
And packed instructions can be completely logically unrelated, as we have seen in the previous picture, basically. If you go back to the previous picture, add, load, move, multiply, they're different instructions, right? They're different operations. You can have floating point operations also, et cetera. We will see in the next lecture, SIMD and vector processors, which are different. They can also do concurrent operations, but it has to be exactly the same operation. So I will show you this VLIW slide in the next week as well to contrast it with the SIMD vector processing concept. So hold on to that. So in that sense, VLIW can exploit irregular parallelism. The instructions have nothing to do with each other, so you can actually exploit fine-grained irregular parallelism between different instructions, whereas SIMD and vector processors, as we will see, cannot because they have to exploit the parallelism where the same instruction, same operation is done on many different data elements. OK, so I've already given you the idea, but uh, let me repeat it again. Compiler finds independent instructions and statically schedules, in other words, packs or bundles them into a single VLIW instruction. And all of these wording, uh, different types of wording are, is used uh, in VLIW literature, packing, bundling, et cetera. That means putting together multiple instructions. Uh, so uh, in multiple independent instructions. So the traditional characteristics of VLIW is clearly you can fetch multiple instructions, execute multiple instructions. You have to have multiple functional units to be able to concurrently execute these instructions. One other characteristic is all instructions in a bundle are executed in lockstep. And this is because compiler controls the execution. If one instruction gets delayed for whatever reason, maybe because of a dependency, all of the instructions wait until they can move uh, to the next stage in the pipeline. And this is a traditional characteristic of VLIW that has made its performance a little bit lower uh, than other architectures. If you cannot find, if you cannot get rid of the dependencies between instructions that are executed in different cycles, of course. Right? And we already discussed that. That's not an easy task. And uh, instructions in a bundle are statically aligned to be directly fed into the functional units. What does this mean? Basically, the compiler has a view of what functional units are there in the microarchitecture. It knows exactly which functional units are in which location. So it aligns the instructions such that uh, the instructions go directly into the functional units. So let me go back uh, to this picture over here. These are processing elements, essentially functional units, right? Basically, the compiler knows that the adder is here. And the compiler schedules the add instruction such that it is fetched directly and routed directly to the adder so that the hardware doesn't need to have a, a network or some wires to move the adder from this location to this possible location. The compiler knows that the memory pipeline is over here, so it puts the load over here. The compiler knows that the multiplier is over here, so it puts the multiplier over here. Basically, the compiler needs to have, in the traditional VLIW, uh, the compiler needs to have a very good view of what the hardware looks like, where exactly each processing element is, such that it packs the instructions in a nice way, uh, such that the hardware doesn't need to route the instruction to the correct processing element that can execute it. This is another example of the philosophy, which we will get to. Basic hardware stays as simple as possible. It doesn't even provide the network uh, or the connectivity to take this instruction to this adder over here. In contrast, basically, the compiler knows the microarchitecture of the functional units and where they are. And it basically ensures that there's no need for routing. The hardware doesn't need to do any routing uh, of this instruction to some other functional unit because the compiler ensures that the instruction is aligned with where the functional unit is. So you can see the philosophy, hopefully. Hardware is simple, compiler complex. So let's take a look at the example, an example uh, execution of the VLIW performance. Here, actually, I had shown you the in-order superscalar before. I'm not showing you again. But here, basically, we're bundling two instructions at a time. These are two wide bundles. An ideal IPC should be two, assuming compiler can pack independent instructions over here, and there are no other stalls. And in this case, we achieve that ideal IPC because compiler has packed independent instructions into each slots, and there are no, at least there are no uh, uh, bubble causing dependencies between different stages in this particular case. Okay. Okay. So we get an actual IPC of two. So life is beautiful, of course, in this case, assuming uh, the compiler can pack instructions nicely like this. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about lockstep execution. Lockstep means all or none, also all or nothing. Basically, if any operation in a VLIW instruction stalls, all concurrent operations need to stall. And again, this is based on the VLIW philosophy. We don't want to complicate the machine. We want to have this bundle of instructions, and we are going to treat them as a bundle. We cannot really break them into pieces. The machine treats them as a bundle. The compiler scheduled them nicely as a bundle. So they just flow through the machine without breaking them into pieces. That's the idea. 
That's why this is lockstep. And this, of course, leads to performance issues. If you have a load instruction that takes 100 cycles in a bundle, whereas all of the other instructions are ads, let's say, that are one cycle, then all of the other ads, independent ads, need to wait for 99 more cycles, right? So that's not good, clearly. So people have tried to develop mechanisms, compilation mechanisms, to minimize the cost of this, which I'm not going to get into, but I'm going to uh, point you to some lectures that may actually talk about uh, this. OK, I think. Uh, something wrong happened with the live stream. I don't know. Can you, can you check that? Maybe I pressed some wrong button over here while trying to look at the chat. Okay, uh, somebody's asking, is lockstep execution related to atom atomic operations? Uh, and uh, um, no, not necessarily. Atomic operations are also all or none. Uh, that is true. But in this case, the lockstep uh, execution is really across instructions that are independent of each other that, doesn't, that don't have to be executed uh, atomically. Okay? It's really just the philosophy of the design of the machine. But yes, if you, for example, want to try to do atomic execution across all of those instructions at the same time, it's going to be easier in a VLIW machine, for sure. So VLIW machine doesn't guarantee that, for example, the memory updates are done atomically by uh, these instructions uh, that are executed in the same bundle. So it's, in that sense, it's not guaranteeing that sort of atomicity, but it's really doing lockstep. OK, so in a truly VLIW machine, uh, purely VLIW machine, the compiler handles all dependency-related stalls. And hardware does not perform any dependency checking. This actually includes dependency checking between pipeline stages as well, not just within a pipeline stage, but also between pipeline stages. So the philosophy is actually very similar to simple reduced instruction set computers, right? Simple instructions. Hardware is simple, uh, compiler is complex. But of course, uh, life is not as beautiful. You run into variable latency operations like memory stalls. Uh, if a load misses in the cache, what do you do? So you have to have some sort of interlocking in that case, basically. You cannot get rid of all possible hardware dependency related interlocking issues because there are some cases where things are completely dynamic, right? You, the compiler doesn't know, essentially, whether you will get a cache miss. So it cannot perfectly schedule these instructions. As a result, you have to have some stalling mechanisms that are implemented in hardware, as we discussed. Uh, and whenever you do stalling, all of the remaining instructions need to stall uh, in the pipeline. OK, so this is, uh, let me talk about the VLIW philosophy and principles. This is one of the papers that are written by uh, the person who has introduced VLIW, Josh Fisher. I can see the philosophy in the title over here, right? Basically, we want to achieve parallel processing with a dumb machine, dumb meaning as simple as possible hardware, but the compiler needs to be smart. And you can see that uh, the claim over here is that we've developed a new fine-grained parallel architecture and a compiler that together offer order of magnitude speedups for ordinary scientific code. So you can see ordinary scientific code here. In scientific code, that's very easily analyzable, where you don't have uh, uh, hard to predict dependencies, these machines can actually do reasonably well. Uh, and in, co in such code where you don't have really hard to predict dependencies, uh, you can actually do well, where the compiler can actually schedule the code uh, really well, where you have large blocks of code, uh, you, you need to execute lots of, lots of uh, arithmetic operations and not that many memory accesses, you can do reasonably well uh, using the LIW machines. But let me talk a little bit more about the philosophy. So if, as I said earlier, the philosophy is similar to risk. Essentially, we want to have simple instructions and hardware. And RISC and uh, VLIW were developed in the 1970s and 80s. Well, originally, RISC was introduced in, in IBM by John Koch in the 1970s, later picked up by uh, Patterson and Hennessy uh, at Stanford and Berkeley, uh, where they introduced the MIPS and Spark architectures. But IBM 801 mini computer was the first example of RISC machine. So what does RISC mean? Uh, basically. We want to have simple hardware, and we want the compiler needs to uh, do the schedule the code, but we have single instruction at a time, whereas VLIW is really multiple instructions in parallel, and the compiler needs to get parallelism across multiple instructions in a clock cycle. So that's the big difference, basically, between RISC and VLIW. There are multiple instructions fetched in parallel. So VLIW is, in a sense, a bit more ambitious because you really need to uh, get the parallelism across these fine-grained instructions. So uh, in, in RISC, the compiler does the hard work to translate high-level language to simple instructions, like the MIPS instructions. Even simpler, MIPS started out actually to be much simpler. Multiply wasn't there, for example. Byte-level loads were not there, et cetera. And it, initially, John Koch actually had the vision that the compiler does 
does not even compile to instructions. It compiles directly into the control signals. Remember, we saw the control signals in our microarchitectures. Imagine writing a compiler that compiles and orchestrates all of those control signals without even having instructions, right? You could imagine that. You could potentially think about that as an FPGA today, actually. An FPGA somewhat does that, right? If you have a compiler that compiles code into an FPGA in some manner, uh, then you, will, you may need to manipulate some control signals if you don't have, the, uh, if you don't have a higher level abstraction. And uh, that was the philosophy of risk initially when it was developed. Of course, control signals turned out to be very, very hard to compile into. So people developed the interface of having simple instructions, but as simple as possible instructions, not complicated instructions like string copy, for example. That's too complicated. You want to add, add uh, and not XOR, simple uh, arithmetic and bitwise instructions, not even multiply, as I said. And of course, the compiler needs to reorder simple instructions for high performance uh, to do this. And the philosophy is that hardware does little. It does little translation and decoding. It stays very simple, no dependency checking as much as possible and uh, no reordering of instructions. But as we discussed early, this is not an easy task to do. So if this is not an easy task to do, VLIW is even harder. So basically, the compiler does the hard work to find instruction level parallelism in VLIW uh, across the same cycle. Within the same cycle, when you fetch multiple instructions, you need to make sure that they're parallel. And hardware stays as, stream, as simple and streamlined as possible executes each instruction, a bundle in lockstep, and compile also schedules the instructions within the pipeline so that hardware doesn't need to do dependence checking. So the, the reason why uh, people wanted the hardware to stay simple is because they can now make the hardware higher frequency and easier to design. That was the thinking. But of course, this put a lot of complexity into the comp compilation uh, and software frameworks. And as a result, there was a lot of activity that happened in compilation and software frameworks, as we will discuss. And that was the biggest benefit of uh, the risk and VLIW movement, if you will, philosophy and principles. They enabled a lot of research into com compilers, and modern compilers got affected significantly because of this. So this is directly from the paper that I mentioned. Uh, very quickly, uh, this defines VLIW architectures. There's one central control unit issuing a single long instruction per cycle. Each long instruction consists of many tightly coupled independent operations. This is fine-grained independent operations that are independent of each other. Each operation requires a small, statically predictable number of cycles to execute. That's important. Statically predictable so that the compiler can do the scheduling nicely. And operations can be pipelined, as you can see. And these properties distinguish VLIWs from multiprocessors because multiprocessors parallelize code with large tasks, right? Large threads, let's say. And data flow machines don't have a single flow of control. And they don't have the tight coupling between instructions, as we have discussed also. And as we will see in the next lecture, VLIWs require none of the required regularity of a vector processor or an array processor, which we will discuss in the next lecture. And commercially, uh, VLIW machines have been quite interesting. Josh Fisher, after uh, he uh, uh, worked on VLIW at Yale University, he uh, formed a company called Multiflow. And he generated, uh, he and his team actually worked on very interesting processors. You can see seven wide, 28 wide processors and compilers, I should say. Uh, a lot of work went into the compiler, of course, multiple trace compiler. And basically, uh, they did build these machines, and they were successful in a small fraction of code where you could actually extract this sort of parallelism through the compiler, but they were not generally successful. Concurrently, Bob Rao uh, with the Sidrome startup, they did the same thing. And unfortunately, again, they were not successful. These startups don't exist today. They were successful for a very fraction, a very small fraction of the uh, let's say, bigger software domain where you don't have, uh, where, where the compiler cannot easily extract this sort of parallels. So in the end, if you cannot extract parallels, if you cannot get 28 instructions uh, that are completely independent in a cycle, what do you do? Well, you know the answer, you insert no ops, right? But once you insert no ops, you're wasting all of that parallelism, right? And th that's going to be one of the problems with VLIW as we discussed. Okay. Transmeta Cruzo, which we will very briefly discuss at the end of this particular part of the lecture, what they tried to do is they basically had a binary compilation system. They translated x86 code. They took the x86 code as a, as a software. They binary translated into an internal VLIW engine. And they were quite power efficient. They, didn't, they never matched the performance of an x86 processor, but power efficiency was quite good. But again, they, were not, they couldn't beat uh, the competition from the big x86 vendors. So where VLIW has been extremely successful so far has been the digital signal processing and embedded processor market. 
and initially some ATI and AMD GPUs, but I think uh, even ATI and AMD GPUs actually moved from the VLIW architecture internally in their GPU cores. But embedded systems still have VLIW, uh, and the, uh, most embedded systems actually still employ VLIW. And one of the reasons is here the code is relatively simple and relatively easy to compile into and relatively easy to disambiguate. And there are multiple reasons for this. One reason uh, why people write that kind of code is they want code to be statically predictable also for other reasons. In an embedded system, you want to have the predictability properties of code so that you, the, you can guarantee deadlines, for example. And that property works nicely with a VLIW machine's requirement that latencies should be statically predictable also. Uh, as a result, a lot of embedded systems successfully employed VLIW. And if you actually uh, program some of these machines, uh, you will uh, have to program in VLIW. But compilers also, of course, do the job as well. Okay, somehow I moved there. So uh, a, a big move uh, in terms of the general purpose microprocessor market uh, to go into VLIW was made by Intel uh, when they wanted to transition the x86 ISA into from 32-bit uh, to 64 bits. They said, why don't we re-examine the ISA completely? And they basically said, develop the IA64 architecture. They didn't just change the x86 to 64 bits. They basically completely revamped the instruction set architecture. And uh, this is based on VLIW principles, but it's not fully VLIW. It didn't try to, uh, basically try to avoid some of the big issues with VLIW, like too many no-ops, et cetera. They called it explicitly parallel instruction computing. And the basic idea, uh, there are multiple differences, of course, from VLIW, but uh, what they introduced was uh, instruction bundles can have dependent instructions now. So if you think about a pure VLIW perspective, it's a big no-no, right? I cannot have dependent instructions in my bundle. Because if you, have, if you put instru dependent instructions in your bundle, now hardware needs to check. Now, to make hardware's uh, job easier, they basically change the instruction format such that a few bits in the instruction format specify explicitly which instructions in the bundle are dependent on which other ones. So this is actually a cool thing. Basically, they specify, they encode the dependencies between instructions explicitly so that the hardware's job is a little bit easier. So of course, this, this is not a great world, if you will. Uh, there are multiple reasons why I64 was not successful. Uh, this is also called Itanium, by the way. It's Itanium architecture. Uh, but uh, it's, not a, it's not the best of both worlds because now hardware needs to do dependency checking. Of course, directed by the compiler a little bit. But software also needs to do dependency checking. So everybody is doing work right now, both software and the hardware, compiler and the uh, microarchitecture. But the reason they introduced these dependencies inside uh, otherwise what should have been an independent instruction bundle is because the compilers are not good at finding, let's say, uh, six instructions or eight instructions that are completely independent of each other. Sometimes not even two instructions, right? It depends on the code. And much of the code does not yield itself to finding that much parallelism. And whenever you cannot find that much parallelism, your instructions are dependent on each other, or you have to put no ops like the traditional VLIW. So I would recommend taking a look at uh, the I64 architecture. If you have time, we will talk about it. They also introduced predicated execution, which helps VLIW as well uh, by having long, long code portions, by converting control dependencies into data dependencies, which we discussed briefly last time. So there were a lot of innovative ideas. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, one of the reasons why it was not successful is because it changed too much in the software stack. So everybody needs to recompile their code to get the 64-bit benefits. Concurrently, what AMD did at the time was they developed the x86-64 architecture, essentially. Uh, they basically uh, said, we're just, we're just going to extend the x86 architecture so that uh, it's 64 bits. We're not going to change anything else. Uh, and as a result, uh, they, uh, their solution to extend the x86 uh, architecture 64 bits was uh, adopted much more easily by essentially everything in the software stack. And IA64 was not adopted, and it had a lot of difficulties. And I'm not sure if Intel is really producing these machines anymore, maybe for a very small fraction of the market. So there are some questions over here. Uh, let me see. Are the instructions also committed concurrently? Yes. The answer is yes. Basically, they flow through the entire pipeline concurrently. So the AMD K5 was a VLIW machine? No. AMD K5 was uh, a, su a super scalar machine, basically, an out-of-order machine, actually, uh, uh, after that. Uh, uh, and then are VLIW machines possibly useful for machine learning applications? Well, uh, let's wait on that. Basically, any, any machine can be useful for machine learning applications, right? And there's a question, how is error handling done if instructions are committed concurrently? Well, well basically, you need to check uh, the errors on a per instruction basis. And if you cannot commit uh, the entire instruction, uh, yes, you may need to break it at that point. So that's a very good point, actually. 
if, if the instructions are completely committed at the same time, if, if the uh, instructions are committed concurrently, if there are no exceptions. But if there are exceptions, you need to handle them uh, in a manner. And VLIW architecture specifies the exce exception, exception handling also. So you need to look at the ISA manual in terms of how the exceptions should be handled and interrupts should be handled in a VLIW machine. So that's a very good question. OK, so let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the VLIW trade-offs. Basically, uh, the key advantage is there's no need for dynamic scheduling hardware. So out-of-order execution is not needed, assuming this works, of course. So you get simple hardware. And superscalar execution is not needed. Again, uh, dependence checking is not needed. So no need for dependence checking within a VLIW instruction, simple hardware for multiple instruction issue. And there is no need for renaming because compiler handles all of that, hopefully. No need for instruction alignment and distribution after fetch to different functional units. Again, hardware stays simple. You can see that advantages are all simple hardware, simple hardware, simple hardware, right? As expected, right? Because that's the philosophy and that's the principle. But of course, this leads to a big disadvantage. Now compiler needs to, or the programmer, needs to find n independent operations per cycle. And if it cannot, it, uh, they insert no ops in a VLIW instruction. And you already know the big downsides of no ops, right? They, uh, 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 basically, you lose parallelism. Your machine is 28 white. You're executing two instructions because you cannot find parallelism that is uh, 28 instructions wide, let's say. This leads to parallelism loss. It also leads to code size increase because no ops need to be encoded somehow in your instruction set architecture. But the VLIW folks actually uh, uh, did, uh, wait a second, something interesting happened here. I guess I have to sign in again. Sorry about that. Uh, somehow Zoom is asking me to leave the meeting. I don't know why. Uh, let me see. This is interesting. OK. Yeah. Let me see. I guess Zoom, Zoom logged me out somehow. So I need to log in again. Let's do this. How do we log in again? OK. Let's do it. OK. It was asking me to leave the meeting for some reason. I don't know. Uh, uh, I guess we need to uh, be signed in. Yes, but interesting. OK. I think I'm signed in again. OK, can you still see the slides? OK, good. OK, cool. Uh, good. At least we didn't have to end the. <laughs> lecture and restart it. That would have been a pain. Uh, but now we can continue. OK, uh, basically, uh, you get parallelism loss and code size increase. But code size increase happens if you have to uh, actually encode the no-ops right, in your instruction stream. So VLIW researchers figured out a nice way of encoding no-ops such that they don't take space. So for example, uh, you could indicate that there will be five no-ops after this instruction. They came up with a really cool, uh, let's say, cute instruction encoding such that they could encode any number of no-ops without taking 32 bits per no-op. You can see the problems that VLIW causes in terms of encoding, right? You would like, you'll have to encode no-ops. So quote size increase is less of a problem, but parallelism loss is still there. OK, so there are also other disadvantages. Whenever you change the execution with instruction latencies, uh, functional units, basically anything in your microarchitecture that affects uh, instruction scheduling, you have to recompile code. And this is a downside. For example, going from a seven-wide VLIW to 28-wide VLIW, you need to recompile code. And there's no way around it, basically. And this is a big problem, right? Whenever you do superscalar out-of-order processing, whenever if you have something you change in the microarchitecture, you don't need to recompile code, right? OK. And lockstep execution causes independent operations to stall because no instruction can progress until the longest latency instruction completes. And as we discussed, that's a problem also. The compiler can try to schedule around it such that it tries to balance the execution latencies of different instructions that are executing at the same time concurrently. But it, again, that's a difficult task. That's asking even more from the compiler now. OK, so let me summarize VLIW. We're almost done. I'm just going to give you some uh, papers to potentially read. But basically, uh, VLIW is actually a qu quite cool and powerful concept that has impacted uh, microarchitectures, especially the compilers uh, that we build today. It simplifies hardware, but requires complex compiler techniques. So solely compiler approach of VLIW has several downsides that reduce performance. You get too many no-ops, 
not enough parallelism is discovered. Even after employing many, many interesting compiler techniques that we will uh, briefly talk about, static schedule is intimately tied to the microarchitecture. Now, code optimized for one generation performs poorly next. That's bad, basically. You have to recompile every single time. It may not even execute for the next generation. You should think about that also. And there's no tolerance for variable or long latency operations because of this lockstep nature. So it doesn't have the beauty of data flow or out of order execution in basically executing instructions in parallel while you're waiting for some other instructions, right? So these are the downsides, but there are two big upsides basically. And the big upsides are most compiler optimizations developed for VLIW are actually employed in optimizing compilers today. Uh, so no op means no operation, right? We've seen this before. Uh, uh, just to make sure it's clear to everyone. Uh, but basically, uh, if you look at an optimizing compiler today, uh, they basically use a lot of the concepts that are developed for VLIW compilation because superscalar machines can benefit from that as well. So they have enabled code optimizations. These uh, compilation mechanisms have enabled a lot of code optimizations as well. I'm not going to go into the details since that's not the subject of this course, but I would recommend you take a look at uh, some of the lectures. And if you're interested, take, uh, take a backend compilers course that discusses these issues. And also VLIW has been very successful when parallelism is easier to find by the compiler. And this has been true in traditionally embedded markets, DSPs, and in early forms of GPUs where your target was really graphics. Today's GPUs have evolved into more general purpose engines. So graphics is a domain where you have a lot of parallelism, right? You're processing an image, for example, or a video. Uh, it's highly parallel, clearly. Uh, and you can, uh, you can do VLIW on it relatively easily. But if you're doing general purpose computation on a GPU, now maybe VLIW doesn't make sense. As a result, some companies that used to use VLIW in their internal shader cores, for example, uh, in their GPUs, they, have to, they had to move to some other techniques that are less VLIW, let's say. We'll talk about GPUs in the next lecture. OK, so that's a big summary. Uh, so one example, I'll give you some example works, uh, is trace scheduling. This was actually developed earlier than uh, this VLIW paper. The idea of trace scheduling is really to find frequently executed parts of the code. So you have this complex control flow graph with instructions inside each block over here. And uh, uh, these are basically control flow. Basically, you profile the code to figure out frequently executed blocks. That's what you do over here. You combine them into a single basic block, take off the dependencies over here, and then if this code is executed like this, if, if this is actually your executed path, you basically optimize the code very nicely across that path. If this is not, then you have to figure out what to do. And these are called fix up code, as you can see over here. You have to add a little more code uh, if the machine is actually doesn't execute uh, this path uh, in, uh, at runtime. So compile can profile the code to figure out the frequently executed paths, such that it can compile mainly to it, but if for this to work well, the frequently executed path actually has to be the path that is ex executed at runtime also. So this is the idea of trace scheduling. It's a very powerful idea employed in modern compilers. Later ideas actually superseded trace scheduling, as we will see. And I would recommend this paper that I mentioned earlier. This is a very long instruction word architectures and the ELI 512 paper. And uh, actually, uh, at Yale, um, John, uh, John Ellis, a PhD student of Josh Fisher, developed a Bulldog VLIW compiler, which precedes a lot of the analyses that are done in modern compilers. You can see their flow analyses. They even do memory bank disambiguation because you need to make sure that the instructions that you schedule together don't conflict in a memory bank. We will see that later on, actually, in the next, uh, uh, next week's lectures. This is a problem with SIMD architectures also, but this is a problem when you have sch statically scheduled code also. You need to make sure the instructions flow in the machine, in all parts of the machine, without actually conflicting with each other anywhere. Remember, we talked about memory banks uh, at the mysteries lectures. We have the same problem in a VLIW architecture. If you have multiple instructions concurrently executing, they'd better go to different banks and they don't conflict with each other in the row buffers of a single bank. And the compiler needs to try to figure this out as early as 1980s, as you can see. And this is a very tough task, actually. This is one of the contributions of this work, but this is a very, 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 very tough task in a machine and a compiler also. And you can see there's trace scheduler, code generator, et cetera. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, there's also memory disambiguation that you need to do, whether two references go to the same location, whenever you have pointer accesses, for example. And that's one of the big problems in compilation, uh, how to disambiguate these dependencies. OK, another example is a superblock technique, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, 
And you can take a look at that. You can see that this was proposed for both VLIW and superscalar compilation. It was developed to improve over trace scheduling. And there was a lot of work done uh, by Wen Mei Hu's group at Illinois to actually uh, provide a compilation framework for multiple instruction issue processors, both superscalar and VLIW. This was highly influenced by the work that I showed you earlier uh, from Josh Fisher. And this is another example uh, of that work. Many of these works actually have won uh, test of time awards because they've influenced modern compilers. Uh, this one is one example, Superblock is another example actually. And if you're interested in static scheduling more, I would definitely recommend uh, that you take a look at uh, our lectures on static scheduling because this is actually a lot of fun in my opinion. And there's a, a more compact version that covers both branch prediction and static scheduling in a shorter way. Okay, let me give you one aside and we will conclude VLIW. And I give this aside because uh, we talked about ISA translation before, but I'm gonna talk about uh, why Transmeta translate the x86 ISA to VLIW. Uh, basically, we said earlier that one can translate from one ISA to another internal ISA to get, it, to, get to a better trade-off space. Your, your uh, programmer visible ISA may not be great, x86 let's say, but you can make your implementation ISA really cool and easy to design hardware for, right? And in, in between, you employ some translation mechanism. So a complex instructions, for example, can be mapped to simple instructions. Internally, x86 architectures, today do it, microarchitectures. Or scalar ISA can be mapped to a VLIW ISA internally. So there are multiple examples of this. Intel's and AMD's x86 processor implementations today translate x86 instructions into programmer invisible microoperations or simple instructions in hardware. So that's hardware-based translation. And Transmeta's x86 implementation, which used to exist a while ago, are translated, uh, basically they translated x86 instructions into secret VLIW instructions software. They call this the code morphing software. And it's actually very interesting. And there are many trade-offs associated with this translation I'm not going to go into. But this is an example uh, picture from the uh, Transmeta's uh, white paper, which is actually a nice white paper that talks about a lot of technical issues. If you can find it online, I would recommend taking a look at it. But basically, uh, they compiled, uh, they translated using this code morphing software, it's a binary translator, x86 instructions to VLIW instructions. And there are multiple reasons why they did it, because clearly they wanted to execute x86 because that's what, where the biggest code base is, was at least in two, uh, late, late 1990s. And while they were trying to uh, binary translate uh, into, uh, uh, into, uh, into uh, their engine, they needed to do a lot of code scheduling also. And VLIW was a very good target for them because VLIW simplifies their hardware that enables them to build a uh, very nice hardware. And also at the same time, take advantage of the binary translation mechanism to do code scheduling. Essentially what they have is a just-in-time just in compiler that compiles x86 code into an internal VLIW uh, processor. And in the end, they gained a lot on power efficiency, but they didn't, uh, as far as I know, they weren't able to match the performance of the x86 processors of the day. And as a result, uh, you probably don't hear about uh, Transmeta uh, as a company that exists today. Okay, there's a lot more to cover on ISAs as well, and I'd recommend you to take a look at these lectures. I've already done this, so I'm going to skip these. So that brings us to the end of uh, 19A, VLIW.